Bonsoir, bienvenue au Festival des Créatives, festival artistique et féministe basé à Genève, mais qui cette année se déroule essentiellement en ligne. Vous pouvez nous suivre sur le Facebook Live et également sur notre site et notre page YouTube où vous trouverez une version euh, en anglais de la conversation qui va suivre et une version interprétée euh, voilà, en français. Euh, donc aujourd'hui, nous sommes le jour euh, pour l'élimination des violences faites aux femmes et plus généralement pour la lutte euh, contre les violences sexistes et sexuelles. Nous sommes très, très honorés de recevoir Judith Butler, qui va être euh, interviewée par Lorraine Bastide dans quelques secondes. Suivra également une conversation entre Roxane Gay et Rokaya Diallo. Je remercie particulièrement la Semaine des droits humains avec qui nous collaborons et l'Université de Genève. Et je laisse la parole. Euh, oui, je suis Francesca Rena, donc je tenais surtout à remercier nos partenaires, en particulier les fonds Maurice Chalumeau et l'Institut éthique et histoire humanité qui nous ont permis aussi d'être là. Et Judith, bien sûr, on est très honorés et heureuse de vous rencontrer. So good evening or good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you uh, so much uh, to Anne Lovely for translating this conversation into French. Uh, Judith Butler, it's my great pleasure, immense pleasure uh, to be in this conversation with you tonight. Thank you so much for having accepted the invitation. Thank you to Les Creatives for being eager to create such incredible events, never, uh, regardless the, the conditions. Judith Butler, you're a philosopher, professor, and researcher at Berkeley University, California. Your name is famous worldwide for having introduced this trouble in gender that has upset a few people, but gave an incredible impulse to queer feminist theory, which, would, which we all should be grateful for. I'm very grateful. You wrote this text 25 years ago. It was on, only translated to French 15 years ago. Since then, your approach became more and more focused on political resistance, social movement, and recently on violence theory. Uh, in your latest book, The Force of Nonviolence, it's not available in French yet. Your thought is famous for being very elaborate, and your writing, sometimes a bit complex. Nevertheless, you are continuously quoted and misquoted by thousands of fans and enemies. Which leads me to my first question, Judith Butler. Do you feel understood? And if you do, by whom? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, uh, thank you very much um, for being here and uh, being in conversation with me. I'm, I'm very honored uh, to be here, but I'm also, of course, uh, sad uh, not to be in Genève with all of you and being able to, to have our conversations in person. Um, so there's some sorrow and there's some hope that we will be able to gather again in a, a, a more living way. Um, but right now we are left with the, the lively connection mm -hmm. and, and that's good. That's good. Um, I, um, I think maybe I wrote that book 32 years ago, and it was published in English um, at the very end of 1989. So I guess 31 year. I guess depending on which which version you have. Okay, I had a 1995 edition, but I was for, yeah. I guess you were already yes, working on yes, it for it, a while there before. There was like a, maybe another edition. I can't. I can't follow it myself. But um, one thing is for sure, it arrived in France in 2005, which is so late. Yes. No, I remember, and I, I worked closely with that uh, tra with with the translator, um, uh, Cynthia, Cynthia Kraus, Kraus, and that was uh, a big a big moment. Um, you know, I used to ask myself this question: Who understands me? Who does not understand me? And I would see an interpretation, and it would make me angry, and I would want to run out and correct it. But that's not what I said, or that's not what I meant. And then after a certain period of time, I accepted that the text uh, gives rise to ideas that may or may not be the ones I intended, especially when it enters into another 
language. It resonates with other concepts and um, other concerns inside a country or a region, um, and it takes on its own life. So, you know, the text no longer really belongs to me. And once I accepted that, I became much more calm. <laughs> and then I became interested, like, oh, what does it mean in Switzerland? What does it mean in France or China? Or how is it received and how do they, what do they think it is saying? And you learn a fair amount about how terms like gender uh, translate or do not translate. Right? And so, for instance, in French-speaking languages, um, at the beginning of the reception of gender trouble, people would say, you can't use the word gender genre in this way. This is ungrammatical, it's on French, it's on Swiss, it's, this term is messing with our language, confusing our mind. But, <laughs> so it was, a, it was a different kind of challenge. Um, and... Uh, but it was interesting for me to understand why. Why, why is that so difficult? Mm -hmm. What is it about French or what is it about French culture or Swiss culture? And I, I have been attacked by right-wing Swiss uh, 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 people who come up to my face and, and tell me that I am the devil. Uh, I, I had to learn a little bit about um, forms of conservative Christianity um, in Switzerland. Uh, that would be that would make people so upset. Um, mm. But I'll just say one one thing about that, which is um, I did not realize that by saying gender is performative, that it's something we live out in the world, or that its meanings are uh, acquired through time and space, um, that it can be historically changed, give rise to new forms that I was attacking a divine law that stipulated what female is and what male is and what their relation should be and what marriage is within the heterosexual frame. So it appeared to some that I was um, explicitly attacking a set of divine laws that kept women and men distinct with distinct values in hierarchical relations, in heterosexual marriage so you know after a while gender seemed to be this term which was responsible was held responsible for feminist movements for reproductive freedom yes. gay and lesbian kinship relations um trans rights uh um uh at any number of uh uh, of social movements that were destabilizing of the family or of the authority of the church. So that was uh, surprising to me, but I learned a fair amount as a result. Yeah. Um, Maybe it's also because of the of the gap in ten, in, in in you know in temporality. Because when your text arrived in France, it was a, a few years before uh, the gay marriage was discussed in the assembly. So all the demonstration against this law were using théorie du genre and your name <laughs> as something scary, and and like the world was going to end because binarism was over. So maybe it's also yeah, the moment when you wrote it was different, di very different from the moment it was received and, and read. Yes, and, but it's always like that. Every yes. time there's a translation, the book enters into a different political and social history, yes. and it assumes a meaning that I could have never understood. And instead of worrying that they didn't understand the book right, I find it interesting that that's what's happened. Um, so now, of course, I'm thinking a great deal about gender and translation because um, otherwise I can't understand What, what has happened to my to my book or even sometimes to my name mm. uh, regarding uh, present tense and 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 in your text uh, I would like to start this conversation with the current situation uh, the coronavirus has made it very clear that some lives matter more than others it has been proven in many countries not in France not in colorblind France where no racial counts are ever done but that the virus was harsher on people of color because of many factors, including access to doctors and the fact there is a majority of people of color among the essential workers who are not expected to quarantine. 
The virus has also impacted disabled people whose life became uh, even worse, whose life condition became even worse. And poor people became poorer. Uh, in France, the highest rate of poor people, 10 million out of a population of 66 million, has just been reached. To sum it up, it seems acceptable for liberal governments and public opinion that, well, yeah, some people are going to die in this crisis, but the market remains healthy, so it's fine, which is very ironic. And it reminds me of that theory you developed over the past 10 years. You stress the fact that some lives are grievable, which is a very hard word to translate in French to les devis plurables, and some are not. Some lives are valued and protected, and other, the power just let die. So when you saw all this happen over the last year, have you had this feeling of like, sorry if it's very ironic, but like, I told you so. No. <laughs> um, I, I think my feelings are probably more, more sad or sorrowful. I imagine, of course, um, yes. I don't. I don't want to be right on that point. Yes. <laughs> I want I want a world to prove me wrong, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, uh, but I do think um, that we have seen, as you say, uh, certain populations are more vulnerable to, well, catching the virus because they are not as protected as others, um, but also having a much worse version of the disease and also uh, thirdly uh, more likely to die and and the reasons for that are complex but they're social and they're economic and um, we can we know in the United States that um, the African American and Latinx communities um, have been most uh, 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 hard hit, they have been most uh, profoundly affected by this virus, um, and people die in those communities um, at a much higher rate. And, um, and we can see all the accumulated social inequalities of life in these statistics because, well, of course, we, we in the US, we apparently do not believe that health care is a human right. Uh, we don't believe that everybody is entitled to health care. We, yeah. we believe, apparently, according to a kind of capitalist religion, that you may get health care if you work uh, and your employer provides it or, or if you can pay for it. So we have built into our system the abandonment of the poor and, the, and for the most part, the abandonment of the unemployed, although there are some social services, but they're hard to get, they're hard to keep. Um, the African-American community, especially in the southern states, have, have always received discrimination when they go to healthcare institutions. They are either not in, not let in, or they do not receive the same level of care. Um, and this then produces chronic health conditions which are then called uh, pre-existing conditions. I mean, yes. they're, they're conditions that have been developed over time that get called pre-existing. Uh, and then, um, of course, um, uh, we see greater rates of mortality. So, um, so one question, your question, is how do we understand um, why people are treated this way? Uh, those who are who have shelter or who who own their own property, who are able to decide the terms of their privacy, they can shelter in place, they can quarantine. But others, of course, live in uh, situations where there is no choice about proximity, and they too are more likely to get the virus and to die. That includes migrant workers in this country. Um, but we can also look at the spike. Uh, of viruses in India, where so many poor people live very, in very crowded conditions. Now, I would say that um, that we do make a distinction between people who are grievable, by which I mean they would be grieved if their lives were lost, and people who are ungrievable, 
those who may die, but who, who's the loss of whom uh, will not be so bad or is expected. Um, especially if we take the case of migrant workers or people who are incarcerated um, or people with disabilities, there can be a common and cruel presumption that these people are going to die anyway. They're going to die early deaths. It's expected that they die early deaths. Uh, workers can be replaced. The incarcerated don't deserve to live. We hear these attitudes, and these attitudes uh, suggest that these people mm, do not have lives that are equal in value to other lives, and that were they to be lost, uh, they would not be grieved or it would not really matter. So we do, I think, in our policies, in our market rationality, but also in our systemic forms of racism, uh, make implicit assumptions about whose lives should be protected and safeguarded, whose lives deserve to live further and to live well, and whose lives uh, can be abandoned or die by virtue of state negligence or corporate negligence, um, and, and the loss of whom will not be mourned. So for me, um, this distinction between who is grievable and who is not grievable is an important aspect of social inequality. We don't always think of it that way. We think about mm, the unequal distribution of goods or the unequal distribution of rights. But I think we can also talk about the unequal distribution of vulnerability and of grievability. grievability. We need to think about our embodied lives um, in this way in relation to the concept of social inequality. Mm. I totally understand your point when you say you don't want to be right. Uh, nevertheless, when you see the way the capitalist, the Western governments are thinking right now, you can see that there is a balance in which they try to like measure, okay, we lost that many lives, but the market keeps up and the economy seems to be functioning. So like it's like really lives are in this in this balance. There is economy and life, and some life are some lives are really sacrificed. So I thought yes. it was like proving your point in such a strong and obvious and instantaneous way. Well, it proves my point, but it also gives further meaning to the point. You know, when you write a theoretical book and you come up with a concept, you don't know where it will be lived out in the world. You yeah. don't know what historical form that will take. Yeah. So, for instance, at the time that I have been writing about who's grievable and who's not grievable. <clears throat> I mean, I think I, I talked about that during uh, the AIDS crisis in the United States and elsewhere. Of course, AIDS continues. It's still a crisis in certain parts of the world. And there was, for me, a question of who could be openly mourned and who whose death was a kind of shame, you know, sh something shameful, had to be hidden. And we had to mobilize as queer people Um, as gay, lesbian, bi, trans people, and also sex workers, and I would say um, uh, uh, drug people who took drugs. I mean, they, they all had to, in some sense, mobilize to say that, you know, our lives should not have been lost. This is terrible. We need, we need medical treatment that would prevent our deaths. And it wasn't until people in the mainstream started getting sick and coming out as sick, mm -hmm. that um, that there was a, a public acknowledgement of the massive loss. So, you know, the mobilization to acknowledge loss and also to make a demand, a demand that we get medication, that we get proper health care, that our lives should be preventable. These, these went together, you know, our sorrow and our anger. <laughs> And, and, of course, it's different when you're talking about uh, the coronavirus, and it's also different uh, when you're talking about migrants crossing the sea and being abandoned by European countries, being left to die in the Mediterranean. Um, uh, that, is, that is different. And yet, we, could, we can clearly say that those who are left to die, nameless, uncounted, um, are considered ungrievable. ungrievable. That's that's a that's a 
that's a, a, an EU policy, <laughs> that these lives remain ungrievable. And that's also true, I would say, in if we think about food policy, you know, how is food distributed? Who is suffering with um, uh, hunger, with, uh, with lack of food sources? These are policies that are, you know, devised through various businesses and governments and intergovernmental agencies. And certain populations, and I think we can see this in North Africa right now, are actually not getting food enough to live. So what is the global decision about them? Right? The assumption may not be one person who's making that decision, but the assumption is these are not grievable lives. These are not lives worth living. These are not lives that have equal value to the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. I think that's the power of philosophy, right? The ability to, to describe situations that could, I don't know, describe a situation that has not happened yet or that maybe happened a thousand years ago. Philosophy is supposed to work all the time, right? It's about just being human. Well, it's, it's, it's trying to bring clarity, looking at the presuppositions of our lives, like what are we living with? Like, do we think it's okay that women suffer violence? Do we think it's okay that there's marital rape? We, that's been the way things been for a really long time. Maybe that's just the way of the world. But if you dig into the presuppositions, like what allows us to accept that as all right, as the way of the world, mm -hmm. right? What, what presuppositions are we living with, unexamined? Seems to me philosophy examines our presuppositions mm -hmm. in order to bring to light the ways we are living, the principles according to, we are, to which we are living, mm -hmm. and, to, and to change them when we see their injustice. Mm -hmm. um, in, in your latest book, The, the Force of Nonviolence, you define violence as a syndrome of individualism. Violence is the denial of the dependency between humans. And you define nonviolence as a proactive, collective way of resisting violence. I had just read your book when I saw some images on social media two days ago. And that gave me, I, I tried to read those images with butler uh, glasses. So those images showed the expulsion of migrants, mainly Afghan people, from Place de la République in Paris by a huge group of yes. policemen, massively yes. using tear gas. Yeah, you saw those images, probably so shocking, right? Flashballs, surgeon, uh, truncheon, sorry, against pacifist people who were just like trying to rest somewhere. Uh, so I can see the dependency in these images, but I can see only one way, the refugees seeking asylum are dependent from the policemen who are supposed to embody a democracy. But are we supposed to make a policeman understand it also depends on these refugees? It also struck me that the refugees were actually using nonviolence in the precise way you describe in your book, because they were actually occupying Place de la République in order to protest against the dismantling of their camp a couple of days before outside Paris. So it was basically an intent for nonviolent protest being literally crushed by legitimate state violence. So this made me very pessimistic. I had the feeling that nonviolence works on an ethical and philosophical level, but not in the real world. Huh. Well, we could say that Gandhi brought down British colonialism through the mass mobilization of nonviolence. And maybe if we imagine that scene at the Place de la République, um, imagine if it, if it wasn't just that group, imagine if it were thousands more, or maybe a million, or maybe everyone in the entire country of France going to their own central, central place uh, in the, in the centre-ville <laughs> to claim solidarity. You know, imagine if that mobilization spread and soon the transportation systems couldn't even work because the, the mobilization was, was so strong. So what we should lament is the fact that these people who were trying to exercise their international right, which they have, to be 
be processed for asylum, to be reviewed for asylum, to have their petition heard, to go through a legal process. These people who were doing that were denied their rights and uh, chose a nonviolent way of protest, asserted rights of assembly, which citizens have, so they acted like citizens, they called to be regarded as citizens. If, if there had been greater solidarity, we would not say that nonviolence doesn't work. We, in fact, um, what we should learn from this is that we need much greater numbers. Uh, and that was also true in the civil rights movement, in the famous um, uh, march to Selma. I mean, more and more people came onto that march and some were beaten brutally by the police and yet more people came forward and more and more and soon in every city, in every major urban city. Uh, and it did lead to massive legal change. Of course, the outgoing fascist is trying to dismantle that or did try, but we will try to, to build it again. That's how it goes. Yeah. And, and I can see how this is linked also to all this um, idea of spaces of appearance you developed in, uh, in uh, other uh, texts uh, in which you analyze some social movements such as Occupy Wall Street uh, or the Arab revolts of uh, 2011. And I was wondering if these weird times that are keeping us apart from public space that are making, that are making like very hard for our bodies to actually like you know, materialize on the streets if you're worried about this, you know, these spaces of appearance, as you call them? Well, of course, I, I worry. I mean, first, I should just say that, you know, people have obviously been keeping solidarity networks alive uh, through the, the uh, internet in ways that are extremely important. There are more cross-regional and international conversations, even this one, um, that are happening, yes. uh, people are strategizing, they're making alliances. So politics continues to happen even if we're not clustered in the public square. Um, but also uh, some of the large demonstrations I have seen, Black Lives Matter yes. here, people were at proper distances, they were masked, they, they handled it really well. The, the spikes in the virus that we have seen have come from the right wing uh, people who don't believe in masks, but not from Black Lives Matter. And that is a very interesting uh, um, fact. Yes. Uh, um, I would say that. Um, but look, we have a different problem that you just mentioned in your previous question. Um, what happens when a group assembles, even safely, and the government says, this is a, pub a public health issue? This is, you must uh, scatter because of public health, and public health takes the place of your rights, right? It is more important than your rights, your constitutional rights, or your human rights, or your internationally guaranteed rights. So we saw what's happened in Poland or Romania, where yes. queer people have had to scatter, where feminists have had to scatter, where trans people have not been allowed to appear in public without arrest. Um, in these situations, we see that the, the power of the state to, to, um, to disperse an assembly or even to criminalize an assembly in the name of public health or national security is um, not only deeply anti-constitutional and anti-democratic, but it's lethal. It's, mm -hmm. it's a use of force against uh, bodies that have, in fact, made themselves vulnerable by appearing in public, refusing stigma, and insisting on their rights. So we are in a very difficult moment, and we have to make sure that the public health uh, powers of the state do not turn into authoritarian, anti-democratic uh, uh, powers that seek to undermine um, and, and destroy uh, social movements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for this point. There is a paradox, yeah. Um, unfortunately, bodies are not the only parts that are attacked by these weird times as we're, that we're living. Thoughts are too. 
Uh, recently in France, social science and especially intersectional and post-colonial researches have been very strongly attacked by our government in a very similar way Trump did in the US or Bolsonaro did in Brazil, and the same way gender theories <laughs> have been for, for years. What do these attacks against uh, thinking, against uh, thought, uh, against theory, what, what, what do they reveal? Is it fear? Uh, well, I think it is fear. Um, you know, I, I guess we could we could look at it psychologically, or you know, through the lens of social psychology, and say that there is a, a enormous fear. I think there's also enormous hatred, uh, and you know, when we think about phobia, right? We talk about homophobia or transphobia. Um, we are talking about fear and hatred uh, and uh, together. And I, I believe that, you know, it's not just that someone like Bolsonaro and his uh, shamelessly homophobic followers um, hate uh, gay, lesbian, trans, bi, non-binary people. They also want to reverse the progress that the feminist movement has made. They want to reverse the progress that the gay and lesbian human rights world has made. They want to make sure the family remains hetero, heterosexual and heteronormative. They want to make sure that single women cannot adopt, uh, they, or, or single men. Um, they, they want to ban trans uh, rights. Um, I mean, they are reacting to social movements. So it seems very important that we see that this is a backlash, a reactionary politics against precisely the progress we have made. And throughout Latin America, they're looking at Argentina's um, constitution, right, which now has a gender identity law. Or they're looking at Ni Una Menos, which has, you know, flooded the streets with feminists, you know, to the point where the police are pushed off the streets. <laughs> they see the Chilean feminists you know, marching, parading, singing, performing against sexual violence on the streets. And these are powerful movements. So they are fighting these movements. They're not just having individual ideas about, uh, about who, um, ab about, you know, not liking gay people. But, you know, there's also, I believe, um, you know, to go back to it, a, um, a real fear that the feminist movement and the LGBTQI movement has um, has de will destroy the traditional family or will destroy um, the divine idea of man, of the human, and will seek to take over uh, the divine power of creation, right? Mm -hmm. If we insist on creating who we are and that they, they see that as one of our aims, if we insist on radical autonomy to choose the nature of our lives, the course of our lives, then we're exercising a form of freedom that they think does not belong to humans yeah. properly. It, it belongs to God. I, I, I really got your point, and, and, and you were talking about Bolsonaro, and we know he's a, he's a fascist, but here I'm talking about Emmanuel Macron, who was supposed to be like this moderate right-wing, even center uh, person, who is now attacking professors in university because they're trying to have an intersectional way of thinking, and he's like almost saying they're like, you know, accomplices of, of terrorism. I think it's really like scary to see, you know, books and theories being attacked this way. It's not social movements, it's not people on the street protesting. It's like people learning and writing and thinking. It, yes. It, it's supposed to be okay in a democracy, right? Well, being on the street too, but... Um, well, of course it is. And it is, it is very frightening. And, um, and of course, uh, Macron has his idea of what the, the, the République should be and what the nation is, right? And if the nation is intersectional, multicultural, in a way that doesn't um, support his idea of republicanism, then he, he definitely has lost the grounds to 
um, uh, to claim that uh, that the that the that the republic is universal or that it's all inclusive. In fact, um, the idea that learning about race or learning about the theory of intersectionality or um, accepting that people come from different backgrounds, that France itself is racially diverse. I mean, this would be to acknowledge that there are differences among populations that should be thought about and addressed. Um, and of course, that would mean uh, not seeing uh, only universal man, mm -hmm. right? So we have to come down from universal man to actually see who's living in France, what their needs are. But he is very frightened of this idea of a multi-ethnic, multi-racial community, uh, national polity. And yet that is what he has. So he's in a moment of denial, not a moment, but a pra long practice of denial that, um, that seeks to censor and oppose forms of thinking that he believes will uh, somehow attack or destroy the, uh, I, the idea of republicanism, the idea of the nation, and the, 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 a certain notion of Frenchness, which is, which is a, a racial notion. Even if he says it's blind yes, to race, it right. assumes a racial norm of whiteness. And it is very distinctly separate from um, uh, the migrant communities that now live uh, throughout France, or even the the the, the non-white communities that have lived in France for decades, if not centuries. Yes. So there has always been this um, in France, but to attack ways of knowing, to attack forms of knowledge and books and ways of teaching, and and we have seen as well um, the teaching of gender has become very controversial. For similar reasons, I, I'm not aware that Macron has attacked gender, but it's not his strategy is no different from the right. Yes, um, uh, and it's the same as uh, the outgoing fascist here, who sought to uh, ban uh, critical race theory because he claimed it is de divisive. Yes, well, some people in France love this. Some feminists in France love this, I'm sorry to announce you. But I, I, I love the fact that you talk about denial. I think it's very, very accurate. Um, I'm trying, and I'm glad you mentioned gender, because I'm trying to take you slowly <laughs> towards gender for the end of this conversation. Um, so thank you to your work and that of Teresa de Laredes and many other queer theorists. Feminist theory has become more sharpened, more complex over, over, over the past um, couple decades. Trans activism has become more and more vocal to the point of seriously upsetting a couple notorious transphobic writers, but let's ignore them. In your view, Judith Butler, is the category of women still a relevant subject of feminism? Oh, well, if you're asking me if the category of women is something we need to think about, yes. If you're asking me whether the only subject who can be a feminist is a woman, I would say no. Um, I, I think that feminism has, from the very beginning, called for the equal treatment of women, for women to have justice in, 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 in the courts, but also in society, that women be free to move in the world and to do the kind of work they want to do and to love the people they want to love without punishment, um, uh, with, with, without stigma. So feminism has always been about equality, about freedom, and about justice. But it's also been a reflection on what does it mean to be a woman? The, the question being, if I'm a woman, do I have to live a certain way? Do I have to love a certain way? Do I have to be inside the social form of the family? Do I have to do this kind of work and not this kind of work? Do I have to accept violence that is done to my body because my mother did or my grandmother did, or I see other women accepting violent treatment. It's like, at the moment we say, no, I don't need 
I don't have to live that way or love that way or enter that social form or do that kind of work rather than this kind of work uh, or accept violence done against me. We are reinventing what it is to be a woman because for too long to be a woman meant accepting that social form. One was a woman within that form. One was a woman if one was heterosexual. One, one was a woman if one complied with certain kinds of norms, which often left, led to isolation, poverty, second-class citizenship, or violent treatment. And sometimes illiteracy or, uh, um, or death. In the in the case of, of 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 violent attacks on one's body, so w feminism has always been about changing what the category of woman could mean. You know what could it mean? You know, you know in in sports, in in life, in various professions, but also within the family, or within relationships. Some man says, "Oh, you're not." acting like a woman when you talk this way, many women now can say that this is how women speak. At that moment, we are reinventing what, it, what that category is. So we need the category of women to be historical. We don't want it stuck in a particular time. We don't want it to have certain fixed meanings that cannot be changed. We want to be part of that social change and that re-elaboration. So, when trans women join us, we learn something about what it is to be a woman. Or when we ourselves decide that I'm a feminist, but I am no longer a woman. I am something else. That doesn't affect my feminist commitments. If I'm non-binary or I'm trans, I mean, all the trans activists I know <laughs> came up through feminism. They're like really strong feminists. Um, so the idea that, oh, there's trans over here and feminism over here is like, what do you think trans people were reading? What do you think Susan Stryker was reading? What, what, do, you, what do you think Laverne Cox was reading? I mean, the, this comes, this sense of freedom to think in more complex ways about what it is to be a woman or man or another set of categories this comes from feminism, and it's a it's 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 the terrain of freedom. It's the terrain of trying to find one's way in a complex world. What are the categories that acknowledge this reality? And and our realities are changing. And when we realize there can be another term for how we have been living all along, a term that is that actually gives us recognition or lets us breathe and move in the world in a different way, then that's good. That's part of a notion of autonomy, of self, of self-determination that is surely uh, part of the feminist movement and has always, always been. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it reminds me of Simone de Beauvoir, but I know it was one of the, of the starting point of uh, gender trouble. On ne naît pas femme, on le devient, and we're still becoming, yeah. we're still making this world being different every minute as yeah. we go on. But if, if I may add to that briefly. Of course. You know, some people say that if we take this point of view that we deny the, the, the actual body, uh, but it's not the case. Uh, I mean, there's an anatomical body, there's a biological body, there's an endocrinological body, there's menstruation for some, there's hormonal changes of particular kinds for others. These are all sex-related, you know, biological, endo endocrinological uh, realities. Nobody's denying that. But if we follow Beauvoir, none of those realities tell us how to live or how to love or in what social form we should exist, or who our kin might be, or how we want to transform the world. None of them tell us that. There is, we, we cannot derive um, who, who we are in the social world from the fact that we are born with certain anatomical features or even chromosomal features that lead the medical authorities to call us girl or boy. You know, we are identified, and even that moment of being identified 
that's a social practice. Sex yeah. assignment is a social practice. So we're born into the world, certainly. Material body, somebody's hopefully holding us or the doctor is figuring out what's what. And, and then the social practice begins. So it's not as if the so-called materiality of our body is created by gender or denied by gender. It's rather that it only comes to assume a meaning within a set of social practices, and we can be part of those social practices. Yeah, uh, it reminds me of the work of Cynthia Krauss, who's, been, who's, who's demonstrated this in a very accurate way, and she's the one who translated gender trouble in, in yes. French. It oh, makes I've, a lot of sense. I've learned a great deal from her. Yeah. She, is, she has taught me a great deal of science, but she's also taught me to think more clearly about some of these issues. Yeah, she, she's been a very, uh, she has a huge impact on me too when I read her the first time. Uh, in 1995, or in the 90s, when you were writing Gender Trouble, uh, you were observing the failure of feminism, and I'm, and I'm quoting you here. Uh, would you say that feminism succeeded, or maybe just progressed in 2020? You know, I think social movements like feminism go through different uh, waves, and it depends in what part of the world we're talking about. Um, I mean, given that I was thinking about feminism in the 1980s, there there seemed to be uh, the late 80s, really. There was there were more tensions between gay and lesbian activists and feminists, which are not unlike some of the tensions we see between feminists of some sort and and trans activists. So I um, I didn't I didn't like uh, the heterosexual assumption that was being made in many feminist books and in many feminist classrooms. It was as if gay, lesbian, queer issues were were not admissible. But right now I'm actually very heartened by the feminist movement. I think we can point to some uh, parts of the movement that have spread across the world, like um, uh, the feminist strike, uh, the various um, uh, uh, modes of, of assembly and protest uh, created by Ni Uno Menos, which became a kind of wave, you know, just a, a wave in Spain and a wave in Italy. I mean, these are trans regional transcontinental solidarities and and they do focus on uh, eliminating violence against women but also systemic forms of inequality and they also interestingly enough um, are joyous and angry movements in other words there's a there's a, a uh, an excite an excitement um, of being together and of being on the street and of changing the world that is is joyous and affirmative and so it's it's not the the idea of feminism that conservatives have oh they are going to stop you from exercising your freedom they're going to destroy your family they're going to take over you know they're against pleasure they're against they're against sex <laughs> whatever everything uh, they're going to control you and constrain you. Well, it's it's true. They they are going to try to 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 stop your violence. They are going to try to constrain your efforts to dominate other people. But they're doing it through producing a different kind of world, which is actually joyous and powerful. And I feel like this effect it moves across uh, class lines. It moves across national lines. It moves across languages. So there is, I believe, um, a new, um, a new, a new sense of the movement uh, that has been enormously important, uh, and that has also, I think, accomplished some legal aims by uh, drawing attention to sexual violence, to rape, to battery as 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 criminal as uh, as radically unacceptable. At the same time, it's not a carceral feminism. It's a feminism that is actually seeking to change the social conditions of work, and the idea of what it, of, of public space, 
and private space, um, producing forms of solidarity that I would never have predicted before. Mm -hmm. It's funny because the way you describe this new wave of feminism, like using the term joyous and occupying the, the public space and modifying the way we think and see, it reminds me of these, I don't know if you had heard of those, but it's those Collage Feminist, it's the group Collage Feminist de Genève who made this last night and it's like really about, you know, putting feminist slogans on the wall and everybody has to see them and it's also about walking yeah. in the street at night and, you know. C'est absolument magnifique, à mon avis. <laughs> I think they're going to be very yes, proud. Yes, yes, yes. I have one question I really wanted to ask you. I have no idea how long we've been speaking. Can can me donner le timing? Ah, parfait. Okay. Um, so recently, uh, a, a French uh, thinker uh, I really admire called Françoise Vergès. I don't know if you heard of her. She, yeah, of course yes, you did. Uh, she, yes. she also she also just uh, launched uh, just wrote a book about uh, feminist theory of violence. And it's funny because I received it this, the week I was working on your theory of violence, and I tried to compare them. And, and there were so many common references like Fanon, Franz Fanon, and of course Angela Davis. And at the end, she says something that I loved. She said, a decolonial feminism answer to state violence could be the right to rest, le droit au repos, the right mm. to peacefulness, the right to dream of a peaceful life. And I mm. thought you might like it too. Yes, I do like it. I have known uh, uh, Françoise for many years. Of course and, you do. Um, And I have also learned from her, her early scholarship on Fanon was very important for me. Um, and she also has, of course, um, a, uh, an important historical and philosophical understanding of black feminism and um, of the decolonial project that I believe we all should learn from. She, she has a long history of activism And she's um, an, a, a model of an engaged uh, in intellectual. But I think it's true that, um, you know, we fight and we fight over all these years. We lose. Sometimes we win. Sometimes we thought we won and then it's all reversed and then we have to fight again. And it keeps coming. It keeps coming, the challenges. We think we have allies and it turns out they're not very reliable. Um, and it is exhausting. Many people, for instance, in the Black Lives Matter movement say that the history of racism in this country, the way it continually repeats, the way every day there's a new story, a new person who's been killed by police or unfairly imprisoned, it's exhausting. <laughs> um, and it's why, uh, There has to always be new. There always has to be new people coming into these movements to um, to take it up so that others can rest. But I think the idea that we might rest um, and dream is uh, belongs to a, a world in which we do finally understand that to do violence to one another, to subjugate one another produces a world that's marked and marred by inequality and violence, and that uh, our more creative um, and, and somatically and psychically healthy life will emerge when, when these fights are no longer necessary because uh, radical equality is, is affirmed and institutionalized and accepted or we, we see that what can happen to the migrant can also happen to me um, the, the police put down their their arms and people are are free to to go back to a home that actually exists and that is affordable and that has heat <laughs> yeah. um, so you know I think there is something to that And of course, Vergès is also a thinker, has always been a thinker. So she's fighting, but she's also, she needs that time to think. And Marx also said this, that we, 
we need as as humans to to spend time gathering our food and have time uh, to to live in repose, to read, to work, to mobilize. But we will exhaust ourselves and make ourselves um, inoperative if we if we can if we are always fighting if we are only fighting so that's one reason there has to be joy um, joy among us helps to regenerate what we uh, regenerate our emotional and embodied lives but also helps us remember why we're there mm. joy and love I guess <laughs> yes yes I think so mm. And, you know, love, yes, but social movements also have conflict in them, and we have to stay with those conflicts because yes. we, that's a place of learning, those conflicts. We shouldn't, we shouldn't insist on a single point of view that uh, represses all the, the various conflicts that do exist. Um, the only way white people learn about uh, racism is by being confronted, yes. and that can be hard. But that's a, a good form of difficulty. That's a form of difficulty that can lead to transformation. Yeah, yeah. We've had this very nice conversation with Loretta Ross a couple of days ago about this, about this calling in or calling out people and how it could make the world a better place. Uh, it's it's yes. funny because when I told you about this right to rest, which which could which could seem very simple. Uh, right, you you reached Ethiopia. You said we were going to be able to rest when equality is gone. So it's like in ages, uh, and it makes me think of the revolution. Uh, like recently, I, I, I tried to, to write a book. I actually wrote it, and and I couldn't imagine finishing by anything else that saying we should turn the whole system around. I, I it's the only conclusion I could reach. So since I wrote this, people ask me how. Do we make the revolution? And I have no clue. I'm just a journalist. So I just wrote this, but I don't know how. So can I return the question to you? Do, do you know how we make this revolution? <laughs> how do we reach it? I'm sorry. I know it's a hard one. <laughs> well, I think um, I think there's some, some key terms for revolutionary action, and one of them is strike. Yes. In other words, stopping the reproductive mechanism through which our world uh, is naturalized, is, is kept going in its current form. And the strike can happen in lots of ways. Uh, the refusal of domestic work, the refusal of violence, the refusal uh, to work without appropriate pay or health protections. Um, Uh, I also think uh, that we have to, especially once the pandemic comes to an end, find new ways of not just assembling in public, but allowing our assemblies to become like the Argentinian street parliaments, <laughs> where we debate political views as part of our assembly. Right? We protest, but we also debate and we practice radical democracy. Um, I think that's extremely important. I also believe that we do need people in electoral power who can represent these views at the level of government. But I, I do not believe that revolutionary change happens exclusively through electoral power. It, it, has, it, it has to It has to happen through the intensification of social movements. Um, and in some ways, the feminist movement has been, in some parts of the world at least, um, more inclusive, more uh, attuned to the questions of uh, race uh, or, or to trans life or to poverty or to class. We need large frameworks in which we We work out these differences and we reject the idea of the universal man, for sure. Um, look, revolutionary ideals are, are sometimes there even in small practices. 
we shouldn't think about revolution as a as a single point in history. It it happens all the time. It's part of our our praxis. You know, it's part of the the way we live, the 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 values with which we live, the ways in which we we exist in space and time with others. So it's important to hold out for a revolutionary change, uh, even if people tell you that it's impractical. Uh, um, maybe it's impractical, but it is a praxis, and it can happen in our ordinary lives, and it can grow, especially through alliances that are trans-regional and trans-linguistic, and that are organized, I think, on radical democratic principles. Well, we should hold on to revolution then. We don't give it up yet. <laughs> no, no. Uh, it's, it's really weird maybe to finish with this question, but I personally been feeling a bit depressed and pessimistic lately. I know many feminists and many people actually have had the same feeling. How, how have you been? How are you? <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm glad that, you know, a, a, a bare majority of the people in my country <laughs> are not fascists. <laughs> so, I drink. I drink to, oh, not everybody is fascist. That's good. Um, no, I'll tell you what, what heartens me. I, and this election is interesting because, you know, the state of Georgia has always been this right way, very conservative, and yet we have this black woman, Stacey Abrams, who went out and... and registered so many people to vote and and Trump lost Georgia and you know she she and her entire team mainly um black activists from the state of Georgia black anti-fascist activists got people to vote who never voted before right who and they they did bring him down and you know we have them to thank for the fact that he he's going to be packing his bags or someone will pack those bags. I, I don't know who packs his bags. <laughs> but um, but also, look, during this time, there's a renewed understanding of the climate crisis and new, renewed appreciation for what does happen when we travel less, what does happen when industries get shut down, our earth starts to repair. What can we do to continue that? Um, There are also uh, mutual aid societies and radical care networks that are introducing really important principles of interdependency, which in my mind are also principles of equality. You know, we depend on each other. We each depend on each other. We depend on each other equally in a world in which this pandemic rages because your life is in my hands and mine is in your hands. And this tells us something about who we are socially. So I think that there's a shift away from individualism, a shift away from nationalism, um, maybe a greater attentiveness to the massive threat to the climate. We're listening to the youth, right? We're listening to the youth movements, especially people my age. So I see also in Black Lives Matter, and in some of the really important Migrant Lives Matter move, movements in, in Europe and, and, and the peripheries of Europe, um, I, I, I see hope. I see, I see change. Um, and, uh, and I think this is, this is no time to, to, uh, to despair. It's that time to rest, right? <laughs> yeah, well, it's a time of enormous sorrow, you know? Yes. So many people ill, so many hospitals overloaded. We see that our healthcare systems and our economies do not, are not prepared. We have not put adequate funding there, right? Maybe this is a moment in which people will finally realize that funding healthcare and education is more important than funding you know, the, the police and the national military. Mm. I mean, there are, there are potentials here that we, we should savor. Okay, thank you so and much. the fact that, that we're still alive and that we are 
still fighting is also a sign mm -hmm. that we've not been muted. Yeah. Someone, I'm sorry, I, I hope I'm not revealing something too intimate, but someone told me you wrote in an email that you had been uh, sleeping and partying lately. And I was like, wow, that sounds like the best thing we should be doing right now, right? <laughs> like, live and, and, and don't, don't get struck by despair because, uh, I don't know, I've been not sleeping and crying lately, <laughs> which is not very efficient, I yes. guess. <laughs> Well, the the idea of Trump going down has 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 been very festive. Yes. But we're also aware that what's coming in is a centrist regime. It's not the regime that represents Bernie or Sanders or Elizabeth Warren or Al Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. You know, the this is not the radical left that is coming to power. But we will at least be able to oppose them <laughs> in a different way. We, it's a different oppositional politics than opposing fascism. Yes. So it's a better fight. Yeah. It's a better fight. And we're resting before we start that fight. Okay. Yeah. Well, in France, we have the opposite movement. Maybe it's the reason why I cannot. I know. Like our president is becoming more fascist every day. So. <laughs> He is. And the Islamophobia is, uh, is terrifying. Yes, it is. Um, I'm going to treat myself with one last question. Uh, my podcast is called La Poudre, and I asked every guest what La Poudre sounds to them, the powder. So what does it sound like to you? Um, well, that's interesting. Um, I mean, maybe it moves from the powder on the face to the traces of... Uh, transformation that are scattered everywhere. The I powder. Love I love it. Thank you so much. I Thank can't you. believe I just had this conversation with you. Thank you so much. It was. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Merci you. bien. Thank you to everyone who's been following. Thank you to the creative. Thank you to Anne Lafley for translating. And take care. <laughs>